Chapter 17. Opiate of the People Taking advantage of the summer school holiday and of his new understanding with Roger, Ari spent the next two months traveling. How he wanted to go back to China to seek out the few leaders who he knew had escaped the purge, yet to do so would only endanger them. He was getting money to them through established channels that were still functioning. Communications were coming out, but there was nothing else he could do to help at this time. The dark night of oppression had descended upon China once again. The entire country was in the grip of a terrible fear that was reminiscent of the worst periods during Mao's reign of terror. It was far too soon even to think of picking up the pieces of his shattered organization and starting over again. Though it had looked so promising a few months ago, taming the dragon was now a lost cause. Eastern Europe, on the other hand, was looking more exciting each day. Going through Checkpoint Charlie into East Berlin, Ari could sense the powerful currents of change just below the surface. East Germany was a dam about to burst. The same was true in Czechoslovakia, Poland, Hungary, and even the Soviet Union. The only exceptions, where the hardliners still held the people in their iron grip, were Albania, Bulgaria, and Romania. Albania was too tiny, isolated, and difficult to work in. It would follow when the other communist regimes fell. Bulgaria would come along, too. Romania was Ari's big concern. There, Ceausescu was taking an ever-harder line against the tide of reform that was surging all around him and threatening to spill over from neighboring countries into his own. The handwriting was on the wall. Dictators who had been unchallenged for so many years suddenly knew their days were numbered, and were beginning to soften in the hope of appeasing the rising tide of demands for more freedom from once docile subjects. Ceausescu, however, was like a mad dog, determined that if he went down, he would take the entire country with him. Play it cool, Ari warned his student leaders in Bucharest and Timisoara. Don't push Ceausescu. His men will shoot you without any conscience. Let it happen in Germany, Poland, Hungary, all around you. Then your chance will come. Such wisdom was not easy to accept, now that the opportunity of a lifetime seemed within reach. Student leaders in Romania, like those with whom Ari clandestinely met throughout the communist world during those exciting two months in the summer of 1989, were euphoric. Freedom was in the very air they breathed, and Ari, in spite of his caution after so many disappointments down through the years, found himself caught up in the compelling sense of optimism. This time, it would come to pass. The goal he had worked so hard to achieve was about to be realized, and nothing, absolutely nothing, could prevent it from happening. The time had come at last. Returning to Paris in time to teach fall classes, Ari found it almost impossible to suppress his excitement and keep his mind on his lectures. "'I've never felt like this before,' he told Nicky over breakfast the first morning he was back. "'I was afraid the disaster in China would make it harder everywhere else and delay everything,' But it's just the opposite. Eastern Europe's in the bag. All of it. Including the Soviet Union? She asked skeptically. The Red Army and the KGB? And those gangsters in the Kremlin? They're not going to roll over and play dead. That's what's so amazing. Ari shook his head in disbelief. He stood up and began to pace back and forth, gesturing fervently. Gorbachev's been undermining the Communist Party, getting ready to dissolve the Warsaw Pact, making secret deals with the West and the Kremlin leaders are following him like sheep. He's been talking about a united Europe from the Atlantic to the Urals for two years. Nobody in the West, except Bush and the Pope, took him seriously. Now suddenly everybody's saying the same thing. Especially the Pope, added Nicole thoughtfully. He used that same phrase just the other day in a big speech in Germany, made the front page in Le Monde. I hope you saved the article. It's in there. She nodded toward a stack of papers on the other end of the table. The Pope. There's something I'm missing here, mused Ari. My mother was a Catholic. I never took her religion seriously. A lot of superstitious hogwash. She was heavily into the Virgin, Our Lady of this and that, mostly Fatima. Our Lady of Fatima supposedly saved the Pope's life in that 1981 assassination attempt, mused Nicky. She appeared to him during his convalescence gave him a mission, and promised a miraculous sign that would cause the entire world to bow to his authority. 
Ari leaned against the kitchen counter and laughed. They print that stuff in newspapers and people believe it? Somebody must believe it. I saved a stack of articles for you, all about Fatima, and I haven't seen any letters to the editor ridiculing it. The assassination attempt on the Pope occurred on the anniversary of the first apparition in Fatima, and John Paul's been back there several times to thank Our Lady. In fact, he dedicated the world to her immaculate heart. She promised to convert Russia and bring peace to the world if the popes would do that. This is the 20th century, not the Middle Ages, retorted Ari. Nicole nodded and smiled. I agree, but read the articles. It's not just Fatima. The Virgin has appeared all over the world and in some places appears daily. She's appeared right here in Paris, in Medjugorje, Yugoslavia, New York, the Philippines, you name it almost, and 900 million Catholics take it very seriously. Ari resumed his agitated pacing back and forth. It was Reagan and the Pope, and now Bush and Gorbachev and the Pope, he muttered, more to himself than to Nicole. I always figured it was strictly a political arrangement, but obviously there's more to it than that. The superstition about the Virgin. It fits in with the whole women's rights thing and goddess worship. It appeals to people who aren't even religious. Don't minimize the religious power, suggested Nikki, probing her memory. Take the Black Virgin of Jasna Gora in Poland. I heard lots of talk about her when I was young. There's a huge shrine that's visited by millions of pilgrims. The Polish people have trusted her as their protector for 600 years. The Pope is devoted to her. Ari came back and sat at the table again across from Nicky, a troubled expression on his face. How do you fight superstition? Catholics are the major factor in Poland. All of my leaders there are Catholics, and I scarcely gave it a second thought. In fact, Solidarity is really a Catholic organization. I'm beginning to see things in a new light, and it's very disturbing. The religious appeal is worldwide, added Nicole. According to the newspaper articles I saved for you, hundreds of millions around the world are devoted to dozens of virgins. Fatima is the best known, but there's the Virgin of Lourdes, of Guadalupe, Medjugorje. The list is endless. There's a black virgin in Brazil that I'd never heard of that's worshipped by millions. Nicky, there's a powerful force here that I've overlooked. Ari clenched his fists and his eyes reflected a new and desperate understanding. Communism was supposed to stamp out religion, but religion was too strong. That's power. Is that what's behind Gorbachev's strange moves? There are rumors that Gorbachev is going to visit the Pope, and Moscow is going to establish diplomatic relations again with Rome. He stood up and began to pace the floor again. I don't know what kind of a deal they've made, but something is going on between Bush, Gorbachev, and the Pope. The Vatican is a key player in this thing, and I never saw it until recently. How could I have overlooked this for so long? I was raised a Catholic. Nicole was staring out the kitchen window onto the tiny square below, seeing none of it, as long-forgotten memories surfaced. I hated it. So did my father. My mother went along. Fear, I guess. That's what my dad always said. But just before he died, he called for the priest. I'll never forget how he changed at the end. He wanted the whole religious trip, everything, and from the church he would despised. I can't believe it, exclaimed Ari. All my life I've been trying to destroy communism, and all the time, right under my nose, was something even stronger and no less authoritarian. I never took religion seriously, a superstition for the gullible, but it's powerful. And I've just realized, probably too late, that it's going to cause serious problems down the line. Here's a thought for you, exclaimed Nicky. If you could get the local priests and bishops on your side, wow, there's a strategy. Ari smiled with satisfaction. We've already done that everywhere we could. The Catholic Church has been the major factor in Poland. Couldn't have gotten this far without it. But when communism falls, the church will be stronger than ever. The worried expression had returned again. Have I worked all these years just to get us back to the Middle Ages? I think you're overreacting, countered Nicole. The church has always been there and happy to work with whoever was in power. Cooperate? Only when necessary. The Roman Catholic Church dominated, crowned, and deposed emperors. Ari leaned against the kitchen counter and stared in silence at the ceiling with unseeing eyes for several moments, deep in thought. 
Religion, he mused, half aloud at last. Who'd ever have thought that the opiate of the people would come out on top against Marxism? Will it enslave the whole world in the end? What a scenario. Ari, snap out of it, chided Nicole. A little melodramatic, aren't you? I wish you were right, but I don't think so. I've given my whole life to something that I suddenly realized could become a disaster. Are we going to destroy communism, only to see Catholicism fill the vacuum? Is that where we're heading? I've had a blind spot. That reminds me, if you're worried about Catholicism, what about Islam? They've got 900 million, too. Abdi's become extremely religious while you've been gone. I tried to reason with him, but it's like talking to a programmed robot. I couldn't get anywhere. That worries me. He was always a Muslim, but not a serious one. I had hopes he'd moderate his position, but he seems to have picked up Islamic fundamentalism in his trip to the Middle East. I need him to open up that part of the world. You told me he refused. He was very emotional that morning. These feelings pass when reason finally takes over. Abdi's brilliant, too smart to let his passions rule his head. If you thought he was emotional two months ago, you ought to see what's happened while you've been away. He's become a fanatic. Submission to Allah is all he talks about. That's the new world order he's dreaming about, a Muslim takeover of the planet. It took three days for Ari to get Abdul to return his call, and when he finally did, the evasiveness couldn't be ignored. Something was obviously wrong. The problem became clear when they got together at a small cafe a few days later. Abdul didn't want to join Ari even for a drink. Raw nerves were betrayed in every word and gesture. The faculty tells me they can't get in touch with you anymore, chided Ari. I had to use a few connections to get your new unlisted number, and then you didn't want to see me. What's going on? Abdi leaned close and spoke in a half whisper. I think my new phone is bugged. Sometimes I'm followed. Who would do that? The Mossad. The Israelis suspect me. Of what? Forget it. I wouldn't have met with you for even a moment, but you've been my mentor. I respect and love you, and especially Nikki. But we can't have any more contact. You haven't joined the PLO. Abdul looked away and made no answer. Abdi, that's not the way to go. Abdul pushed his chair back and stood to his feet. His face was a mask of pain. Don't try to contact me. Please, it could be dangerous for you. He turned to leave. Ari jumped up and stood beside him. What about Nikki? She's been like a sister. Will she ever see you again? You can't do that, Abdi. It kills me to see this happen. I, I'll try to get in touch with Nikki. His voice was a hoarse whisper. There were tears in his eyes. I want to see her and explain and say goodbye. He turned quickly and threaded his way through the closely placed tables out onto the sidewalk and, without a backward glance, melted into the night.